let's start. We'll start our usual with um, 30 seconds of quiet time between um, you and the Lord and me and the Lord to deal with anything that um, that we, might separate us like sin or attitude or things like that. And uh, I'll start with a prayer in 30 seconds. Start now. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word. Help us to understand these things you put before us by your Holy Spirit and the uh, true teacher of the word of God. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to uh, compare the things we already know with what's being presented and that we spend the time to evaluate it and make sure it is absolutely true. I ask these in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we are on... <coughs> Revelation chapter 13 and today is December the 27th, Sunday. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. And uh, if you were on Tuesday's class, we went through verse 1. And I said I wanted to come back to one last piece of it to kind of clinch it together. So I'll read verse 1, then I'll go to the part where we left off so that we can make this comparison on each head of the blasphemous name. Um, so let's read the verse, and I'll read it as it sh actually shows in the NIV. It says, The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw the beast, <coughs> saw a beast come out of the sea. And we explain that. This is the first beast as compared to verse 11 in the same chapter. And this is the Antichrist, sometimes called the King of the West, we listed all the, um, all the other names he had in the scriptures. So I hope you wrote those down or had them written down. And uh, it had ten horns, it had seven heads, and it had ten crowns. Um, and it had ten crowns on its horns, and each had a blasphemous name. Jeannie Beanie. Mm -hmm. So um, let's just touch base. So, so one of the things I wanted to talk about is that the ten crown part is an orienting point. Okay, um, we talked about it last time, but it's always an orienting point. The seven heads, the ten crowns, the the uh, the ten horns. Horns meaning power, you know, and heads meaning as we talked about. We'll we'll kind of complete that piece here. But we talked about it last Tuesday about those seven heads, and those seven heads are religious religious heads okay they are actually religions that were very specific and we covered that in chapter 18 of uh, uh, chapter 17 of uh, revelation last 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 tuesday and uh, but note that what it says here uh, it says um, on each head talking about the seven a blasphemous name so this 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 the antichrist has these on each of his heads and this is what he has okay so the blasphemous names or the blasphemy of those false religions. And uh, as we know, the, uh, it's a reference to uh, Israel and, and, uh, at, at its time. And, and you know that why is it using Israel specifically? Is because the tribulation is the time of Israel. It's the 70th week. Okay, so once you get past chapter 4, you go into the tribulation and that obviously ends in chapter uh, 19. As we, as we go into 20. <clears throat> but I wanted to look at this particular piece because the reference of the ten horns is very specific to this dictator. Okay? So it's, a, it's an orienting point. When you find it, you know all of a sudden you've crossed over. So if, 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 when you're talking about the, the great and terrible beast, as you're reading him in Daniel and other pieces, uh, especially in, in prophecy, what will happen is that you'll come to it and all of a sudden it'll have a, like a, 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 an add-on sentence to it, like it stopped and it started. And then when it starts, it'll usually start with these ten crowns. Okay, and we talked about it before. These crowns are a reference to the revived Roman Empire of the European Union, of almost a re-establishment of the original Roman Empire. And what happens in the tribulation 
um, as part of that, um, it gets re-put together. Now, as I said before, this is why people get all excited when a few, you know, few decades back when the European uh, Union came all back together as a, uni as a united uh, kind of a uh, united force in the world because that hadn't happened before since, it, since the Roman Empire came apart back at about 500 AD. Some people will put it back into, um, put it about 700 AD, but most, most scholars agree it's about 500. Um, I think it was Odebacher. But um, anyway, so let's kind of go to this piece here. So this is the part I wanted to focus on to, 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 to show you that he also will be the leader of the uh, ecumenical religion of the world. Okay, and, um, and, and those, those seven empires we talked about, the seven heads equal the seven empires of religious empires. And these are the, all the ones that which Israel was involved with in the Old Testament, okay? And, and some of the New Testament, obviously, in the, in the Gospels. Um, but the heads were the Egyptian religions, the Assyrian, if you know their history, you'll be able to follow each of these, the Chaldean, the Medo-Persian, that would be Cyrus II, Cyrus the Great, uh, Greco-Macedonian, Greco that means Greek, uh, it's actually Lower Greece and Upper Greece, and that would be uh, Alexander the Great, and then the Roman Empire, which we've talked a lot about, and as you remember, the Roman Empire had just oodles of religion, so it really did. Uh, in fact, to the point of emperor worship was probably the primary one, which will actually be kind of a, a piece on this one as it divides. You will have all, the entire Roman Empire was one of emperor worship, and then as you have the break in between these two empires, it starts up with the revived Roman Empire, and there will be one emperor, and that will be the king of the West. He will be the one of the revived Roman Empire. But in between those two, when we see these separated, that's if I can get that right, there's camera there, separated, there's at least 2,000 years, uh, 50, 1,600 years now, 1,500 years uh, between that. But when we look at it, we have the church that is in between those, which is 2,000 years old now, and it is called the intercalation, okay? And intercalation is a, a theological word it uses to, to mean the word to insert. Okay? It means that the church age does not consistently go together. You would think the 69th week and the 70th week would be side by side, but they are divided by the church and there's an intercalation of the church being inserted. Okay? Um, and one of the reasons that being, it would be because of them being the very family of God, which is why the mystery doctrines of the church are so very different from the age of Israel. They are very unique. One of the problems we have today in Christianity and have had for uh, hundreds of years, actually millennia, is the fact that many teachers and pastors are trying to put Christianity back into the age of Israel of when Jesus was on earth. In reality, the law, and include the law into it, but the law no longer, uh, we are not under the law, nor are we accountable for the law, the reality is that we are accountable to a much, much higher standard. And that is the life of holiness and to be Christ-like. So this is that religion. This is the one between the two. And this one over here is the seventh head. Okay. So if you counted those, Egypt 1, Assyrian 2, Chaldea, uh, Medo-Persian, uh, Medo, uh, you have the Greco-Macedonian, you have the Roman Empire, that was the sixth one, and the seventh is that one. So that's the seven heads. And whenever you see that, it is a reference to that. If you don't get that, you will be confused for the rest of this discussion. Okay? So let's go to uh, the verse I wanted to go to before, which is Revelation 17.3, which I read. Uh, previously, uh, because it gives us an orienting point, and this will make a lot more sense when we get to the religion uh, part of Revelation, which is chapters 17 and 18, and most of us know those uh, as the time of the whore of Babylon. Okay, so let's read verse 3, um, and I think we read some of these before. Um, if you read some of the other verses surrounding it, it'll kind of tell you who the woman is, okay? And the woman is religion, okay? And I'm not going to make anything of that um, other than the first falseness about doctrine was through Eve. So I imagine that's why that has that put together. And, it, and it's, it's really associated that direction. 
So it talks about the, uh, the verse before it talks about the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with her wines of her adulteries. And if you're familiar, one of the things you have to be familiar with is that the adulteries of prophecy are always when the people of God go and have relationships with other religions. And it's called adultery. You're very familiar with it in Ezekiel and in Daniel where uh, Israel had uh, relationships with other religions and they were called adulteries by God. So that's what that's talking about. Um, it says, but the piece I want to get to is, is three, where, where John's talking about being moved into the Spirit, into this um, uh, panorama that he sees in this vision, okay? He says, and then the angel, uh, this is the teaching angel that was, he was with, the explanatory teaching angel, carried me uh, in the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, into the desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. And that woman is false religion. We are surrounded in the world today by false religion. Okay? There's only one true religion, and that is Christianity. And it's very simple. Uh, if you are a Christian, you take that as a, a doctrine of faith. There is one name and one name alone that you can be saved. That is Jesus Christ. Um, so that tells you that right there. Um, but it says here, I saw the woman sitting on, so it's false religion, uh, religion sitting on the scarlet beast. And in this case, this is this same beast, and the scarlet part comes from the blood of the saints. Okay? But here's, note this verse that's right here, it says, um, the scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. See? It's a reference back to this very verse about how, his head, how he had the blasphemous names on him. Okay, and though it's going to seam it up here again, the last piece of it, and seven heads, those would be the false religions, and ten horns. And whenever you see the ten horns, this is the European Confederacy that is a remake of the, um, the original Roman Empire. And then it goes down from there about her, um, how she's dressed like a prostitute. Um, in reality, that prostitute is a, is, a, is a comparison to the one true religion. Okay, which is the religion that we have of the wife. And it is very similar to that when a, when a believer in Jesus Christ is involved in other religions um, as part of the wife, she is acting like, a, he is acting, or he, the person, is acting like an involvement with a prostitute. Okay, so hopefully you see that because this head part comes up you, and you know that he will be the one this is why if you're familiar with it and we've talked about it before when he when he joins all the religions together in the first half of the seven years okay the, the, of the tribulation the first half he makes an agreement if you remember a covenant with Israel that's one piece of that he makes it and he draws Israel into his ecumenical religion. Ecumenical means general, common. It means, uh, the, it, it means unity. And the, the best piece we have for this, uh, and we'll run into it, is the part that I've written, that's actually down here, uh, to coexist. Um, this is where this comes from. If you want to know where coexist means, it means that all religions stand on the same platform. Okay? Uh, it wants to gather all of them into one, no matter what they are because that makes them common. And what happens is the original piece that this happens is in the first half of the tribulation. And the one who is over this is the beast, okay, the king of the west. And he tries to move Judaism into, which is Israel's, into that by making a covenant with them. But in the middle of it, he cuts that covenant off, and no other religion is allowed after that. What happens is he spreads all of them out, and he says, I will have no religions. You will worship me. And what is that? The abomination of desolation. Okay, and we'll get to that uh, later on in this piece here. So let's read verse 2. It says, The beast I saw... Now remember, the beast we are looking at this time is the is the is the fifth beast. Actually, it's, it's the half of the fir, of the fourth beast with the separation. It's the it's the beast of the king of the west, which is the beast of the uh, the uh, revived Roman Empire. And, and then he's making an analogy. He says the beast I saw. This is John speaking. Um, um, resembled a leopard, okay, but had feet of those of a bear, in the mouth of like that. 
of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. I'm going to read you another um, translation of it. It says, Furthermore, I saw the beast which was like a leopard. Now note the word like, okay? Remember we talked about this before. We were, this is a host. I think I wrote it up here. Um, to be like is the word host. I mean, here it is right here. Uh, it's on a different verse, but it's up here too. Um, and it means, a, it's like a simile, a metaphor. It's a, it means to be like, but not to be, okay? So they're making comparison here. Uh, which was like a leopard. Uh, also his feet uh, were like a bear. His mouth was um, like the mouth of a lion. And remember what that is, okay, that's a powerful uh, piece. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now the beast here is exactly like uh, Daniel 7, except what's interesting about it is they're in reverse order. Okay, if you remember uh, the way they came out before, they came out as the lion, that's the Babylonian, Neo-Babylonian, also called the Chaldean, and then the bear, that would be the uh, Medo-Persian, okay, that was uh, Cyrus the Great, and then the leopard um, was Alexander the Great, which is the Greek of Macedonian. But the order of the beast will be uh, opposite of that, and what it's really talking about is the, the speed at which Alexander conquered the world. So it's making the same comparison. When God put them in there, he put them in that order because that's how they historically rolled out. But on the, on the revived Roman Empire beast of the Antichrist, he will roll out differently. He will roll out that he will have speed that is, that is faster. Because if you remember the very first thing he does that when he becomes the, the, uh, the king, is that he usurps the entire ten, he conquers three of them, and therefore establishes his power as the uh, ruler over the world. He does that very quickly. Uh, in fact, I suspect he does that within days. Um, but this is a reference to Alexander, because even today, the quickest conquering of the world was done by Alexander the Great in uh, 12 and a half years. And then it's followed by the bear. And the bear is a very interesting animal, uh, but it has a lot in common with, um, with this particular piece. The, pair, the, the, the piece is a bear, and his feet are extremely agile and extremely powerful. One of the most dangerous animals is the bear, because he's powerful and he is, he, he's very agile. But this particular piece here has to do with the fact that is, a, is an indication that the very first thing that he does is he makes peace with the Jews, okay? And if you remember the peace with the Jews, that's what happens in the first half. That is also indicative of Cyrus the Great. Remember, he was the one who made peace with them. He is the one who restored them to their, to their country, uh, if you remember that. Um, so, and then the lion uh, is kind of the most powerful part of the end of it. But this is also what the one who made the enemies uh, with Israel, okay? And that would be the Chaldean. Uh, that's the first thing he did, is that was his enemy. So we we'll just touch bases here so we can see them. Notice the reverse order, which is important. And then we'll, we'll kind of clue in on verse 7. We read this the other day, so let's read it again. It just orient us. You will find that you will learn a lot um, about the book of Revelation. Uh, from the book of Daniel. Uh, in fact, when we taught the book of um, uh, Daniel, I think it was two and a half years, and we spent a lot of time in Revelation <laughs> for the exact same reason. So, uh, verse 4. I was there before. But notice how it rolls out. This is the vision that he's, he's explaining to Belshazzar, uh, Belshazzar uh, the king. And it says... The first, uh, the first was like a lion. It had wings uh, on, uh, uh, of an eagle, meaning it was very uh, uh, fast in the way that it, it, it conquered um, its speed. He says, I watched until the wings were torn off. And that was actually when, uh, when he died, if you remember. Um, it was lifted up from the ground so that it stood. He didn't die. He, this is when he was out in the field. Sorry. This is when he was out in the field. Uh, this, is, this is Nebuchadnezzar. It was torn off and he was lifted from the ground. 
uh, so that he stood on two feet like a man. Okay, notice this is the restoration of Nebuchadnezzar okay, as the king. And the heart of a man was given to it. Uh, this is the heart of God. This is when Nebuchadnezzar had the human, the human viewpoint that, like Daniel did, of knowing who God was. And you remember he prospered twice as much. Um, verse 5, note, note the order backwards again. And there before me was a second beast. This was the medial Persian, um, which looked like a bear. It was raised, on, uh, um, raised up on one of its sides. That means it was lopsided as a, as a bear. And that was because the, it was the Medo-Persian Empire. And if you remember the story, Cyrus the Great was a Persian. Okay? Uh, and he conquered his, uh, his grandfather, his, his uncle, um, I think it was Astyages. And they were less powerful, but he joined them together as a single empire to conquer the world, which he did conquer the world. It took him 25 years. It took him twice as long. Uh, it was raised on, on one of its sides, and it had three ribs uh, in its mouth. Okay, and that's the reference to um, the Mede, the Persian, Babylonian. Those are the three, first three he conquered. Okay, uh, between its teeth. And it was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh, which means conquer the world. Okay, sorry you weren't, for the, uh, you weren't there for the Daniel study, so. Um, after that I looked, and there before me was another beast, uh, one that looked like a leopard. This was uh, Alexander the Great in his fantastic speed. He says, and on its back were four, four wings. This is a reference to his four generals that ended up dividing the, dividing the empire up after he died. Um, that looked like a, uh, those of a bird. Um, this beast had four heads, and it was given the authority to rule. So we're going to stop there. So it kind of shows you, this is, this is, he's taking attributes from each of these things and showing that all those attributes have been pulled together into... Uh, the single uh, terrible beast. If you remember, whenever Daniel talks about him, he doesn't give him a name like the other ones. He always calls it the great and terrible beast, the powerful beast, the one that crushes everything underneath it. And that is both true of the Roman Empire, okay, uh, as a, a Roman Empire, as well as the revived Roman Empire. In fact, the motto of the Roman Empire, a reason it was most powerful, it, was, it has been the most powerful empire in all history, second to nobody. It ruled for virtually a thousand years. You know, nobody else has done that. It was the last truly world empire. Okay? And it also had a principle, and that principle was Pax Romana, accept it or die, or we crush you. And whenever, that was always the choice given to all the countries. And when they didn't accept it, the Roman Empire just wiped it out. Okay? Um, a perfect example of that is the Carthaginians. Carthaginians were actually were actually Greeks. They were very powerful Greeks. And if you remember, those were the uh, the wars they had with them. I'm trying to remember the name of it. But they crushed the. Um, that's where uh, Hannibal came from. Okay, he was a Carthaginian. But they crushed them. And when they wouldn't, when the Carthaginians would not accept the rule over uh, the complete total rule over them by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire wiped them out completely, and there are no, no more Carthaginians. So, notice the resource order. Now we'll go to verse um, 7, and we'll see this piece come in here. And this is the part I wanted you to see. What you'll see is you'll see a transition. You'll see it talk about the, the first piece, the Roman Empire, and then it'll mold over to the second piece. And how do you know that? It's because the words it used for the revived Roman Empire cannot be applied to the Roman Empire, the original. So in verse 7, it says, After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast. Okay? Terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had iron teeth. Okay? It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. Okay? That's the part I was telling you. That's the Pax Romanus, which means Roman law. Okay? Um, it was different from all the former beasts. Now, it's a unique one, okay? That, he's telling you it's unique. Everything about it's unique. And it says, and then he puts a little thing on the end of it, okay? When he's, Daniel sees the vision, he sees the same thing that John sees 700 years later, okay? And he says, and it had ten horns, okay? The same ten horns 
in verse 1. The same power. Now, in reality, that's not true of the Roman Empire, but it is true of the revived Roman Empire. And um, we could read more of that. There's actually a lot of it that applies. We'll get to it, and you'll read it over and over again until you have it memorized. So let's go to Revelation 12, 3 for a second, and we'll get this same identifier. Now you remember this because we studied this, but now we're in it, okay? So we were seeing the kind of the preview by what Satan the dragon was known at. In reality, um, if you remember these right, these sat over top of each other, okay? Um, it says here, and another, and another sign appeared in the heavens, an enormous red dragon. Okay, that's Satan. Uh, we, we all know that. We, we talked about it when we were there. With seven heads, same seven heads, he, ha he is the author of all religion. Okay? And we've talked about this before. Religion is the greatest thing that Satan has ever come up with. Ever. Okay, what it does is it competes with the true religion of God, which is faith in Jesus Christ, whether it, is in, whether it was before the cross or after the cross. Okay, it, it, it is the one true religion, and what Satan has really done is his, he's given you kind of a multi flavor of any religion that you want to have, just not Jesus Christ, just not Christianity. This is why. Um, I'm not going to get much deeper than that without getting in trouble. But this is why you can have a peaceful religion or you can have a legalistic, murderous religion. You tell us what you want, Satan's going to provide it. And if you look at Christianity as being the very pinnacle, the absolute one and true, you can do a, almost a spectrum all the way around like a circle and you can find every piece of, of, of what you would want in a religion. Um, it's just not the one true religion, okay? It means that you can have anything you want, but you can't have Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's it. As long as you pick anything else, you are in religion. And so the, the marked piece that is diff different from Christianity is that you anything you want to do in religion, and Satan will accept it, the world will love it, until you mention the name of Jesus Christ. And then, then you get the anger, then you get the wrath, then you get the condemnation. Try it. Try it any time. Okay? Feel free to try this thing out. Okay? And then also it has with this piece here. It says the seven heads and the ten horns. See? The ten horns come up again. It is an orienting point. Okay? It pushes us from the, from the Roman Empire to specifically in the revived Roman Empire because this has never existed in time. That's how you know it's in the future. It's never existed. There's never a time when there were ten power centers in the Roman Empire or in Europe any time in history. Okay? And the, and the seven crowns on his head. And we could go through the rest of it. But it actually does identify him so that you... Verse 4 identifies this. He swept his tail and a third of the stars were, were, were uh, taken out of heaven and flung to the earth. And then this is the part where he chases uh, Israel. And we, we've talked about that as part of the abomination of desolation. So we have, we have a pretty good idea of uh, where we're at there. So the, we lined these all up across essentially thousands of years. Uh, we lined it up here. And this vision still, in reality, has not taken place. Remember that, even though we're in it, it's still in the future. So in reality, we've, we've connected these, which is how you, how you do that. Um, and, and why do we do that? Um, the reality is there's a principle and it's, in theology, it's called hermeneutics. Uh, most of us just use the word of uh, the, the biblical rules for interpretation. And that's what hermeneutics is. But one of, the, one of the great principles of that is the ones we talk about here is context, context, context. And the other one is that the only true interpreter of Scripture is Scripture. Okay? You can't just make it what you think it is. You can't make it from the world that is around you. You have to make it from its original place, okay? And that's part of what they call exegesis. You take it to its original meaning where it was at, which is why we pick up the word head. And when we see the word head, you have to go back to it each time, okay? To orient yourself. 
Um, okay, so where were we? Okay, they were right there. Do, 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 okay, like, we got through that piece, that piece, that piece, and that piece. Um, okay. This is, a, this is a really important piece here. Um, for most believers don't know this. He says, the dragon gave uh, the beast his power. His power, okay? This is, now think about what Satan has. This is, this is Satan, we all know that. He has the power to blind people. This will make a lot more sense. When you see, well, actually when you see it down here, but you see it as we go through, in reality, Satan is the great blinder, okay? He makes it so that you do not see right. Once you move away from God, in reality, it is easier for him to blind you. Matter of fact, it says that in reality, the entire world, other than believers, serve him because they are blind. Okay? Many believers do serve him, but it's because they have gotten away from the word of God, which is the way that we see God. Okay? We know who he is. Okay? He has the power over death. Okay? And note that he killed all of Job's uh, children. Okay, God gave him that power. Uh, it's called the sin unto death. When um, in First Corinthians chapter five, when Paul turns the turns the, um, the the young man who's having a relationship with his stepmother uh, over to Satan, he's essentially sa turning him over for the power of Satan to bring him through to the, the the sin of death if he does not repent. But we know he repents, right? We read we read Second Corinthians. Um, so what does this happen, and what does this offer here? He offers him his power, he offers him his throne, he offers him his great authority. Those are the words that are under this. So the Satan gives them to him, okay? So where do we find a similarity to this? I'm, and I broke something up here. So here's Matthew 4, 8, and I broke it up here with a verse that's in Luke for the same description that tells us something that Matthew doesn't. And then we jump on the other side of it to finish up. So that's how we're going to read it. So let's go to Matthew 4, 8 to see how this happened. I wish I could say I heard, I heard the pages moving. but Okay. And we're familiar with um, where this is at. We're familiar, we're familiar with this verse because this is the temptation of Jesus in the, um, um, this is the temptation of, of Jesus in the desert, okay, where he's tempted for 40 days. Um, if you remember, he's fasting uh, in, in all this time, and um, Satan has a chance to harass him, which he takes from. And I'm not going to take you through all of them, but notice that Satan uh, has the opportunity to go after Jesus when he's his most vulnerable spot, Okay. So um, let's, we're going to start with the part that is important that relates to this verse. Okay, it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Okay, stop. Okay, we're going to stop there for a second. We're going to jump over. We'll finish that, but we're going to jump over to it. So notice that he, he shows him the entire, all the kingdoms of the world. Okay, then we're going to go to Luke um, Four, if I can find Luke. Luke four six. And this is the word I'm going to pull out of it. Uh, and the reason I mean, if you notice, verses four through thirteen, uh, and verses one through thirteen in Luke four, cover the exact same piece. It's a parallel. And many times I've told you is that when you have a story in one of the Gospels, you should read all three of them, and four of them, if they happen to be in John, a lot of times they're not. But you read them because what they do is they tell you things that the other person missed. And they didn't miss them on purpose, but their viewpoint and what they were trying to write for had a very specific viewpoint. It's like looking at a car accident with three different people at three different vantage points, and maybe a fourth one, is that when you, when you look at it and you hear their account, by listening to all of them, you get the full account, and you can tell all the pieces that are important. And that's how it is in this case. Um, so it says, And he said to me, um, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me. Okay? And I can give it to anyone I want to. 
That's the basis right there. And then where he goes in the verse 7 is where we jump back here, which is the continuation. So you can take this verse and you can insert it as a specific um, piece that's, that uh, Luke inserts in here so we can look at it. So what does this tell us? Is that this confirms a doctrine we already know, is that, that, that Satan is the God, small g, and ruler of planet Earth. Okay? That's what he says there. That bonifies the offer that he's going to give to Jesus. Okay? And it happens in Genesis 3, 6. Okay? What, that, this is how we know where it happened. Okay? Genesis 3, 6 tells us that as soon as uh, Adam took the fruit and ate it, his rule ended. He now subjected himself and us as slaves of sin in the world. Okay? No longer the ruler, but reality as a subject. Okay? Uh, taking, taking reality, handing it over to it. And this verse confirms that, as does other verses in Ephesians. So let's go to verse, uh, back to Matthew 9, continue this up, so we understand what's happening here. He says, all of this I will give you. He said, if, and this is a uh, second class condition, if, if, and I know you won't, <laughs> okay, if you will, if, if uh, okay, if you will bow down and worship me. He is asking his creator to bow down to him, okay. Um, in verse 10, this is the best part, is that you think, and I, and I wish I would include verse 10 here, is that you think that Jesus as a man is somehow um, uh, under the power of this great and powerful beast, being, uh, Satan. But, because you know him, he goes through the different trials, right? The trial ends with this last one. He keeps trying to get Jesus and the other ones to do something that will make him use the power of his own divinity of the second person. But he will not do it. Okay? He always, he always does what his father tells him to, as he's going to do here. But Jesus says to him, Away from me, Satan. That's a command voice, exclamation voice at the end. Okay? What is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He dismisses Satan, and Satan obeys, okay? That's how we know who's who, is that Jesus, the man, had to go through that um, in order, as his original test, to be able to take on the next three and a half years of his ministry. And he does, and he passes it with flying colors. And it tells us a lot. What happened there is that Satan made the offer to Jesus Christ with the idea of this, is that guess what? I will make you ruler of the whole world, and it is mine to give to you, and you will have all of its authority, and you will rule it completely, and guess what? You don't have to go to the cross. Now, most of us get that, okay? But if you can imagine the temptation, this is the truest temptation, is Jesus understood that the sins of the world were going to be poured on him. It is the, it is the most awful time in all of history and non-history that Jesus Christ would do that for us. There's nothing worse in all of eternity. That's those three hours. And that was the offer before him as a man. And he knew that he would be the one who bore it as a man on the cross. The deity of Jesus did not bear the sins of the world. He cannot. That's why Jesus had to be a man. Okay? So this, this is a tempting offer, okay? Jesus dismisses him, thank heaven for us, okay? Um, and, and that happens right here, and he dismisses Satan. The offer that he dismissed is the offer that this beast takes. The offer is made again, okay? This, uh, the, Satan, just so you know, has tried to bring about this time since the beginning of man, he has tried to bring his Antichrist. Okay, he has tried to, but God has not allowed him to because that timing has not been perfect. Okay, um, but 
the timing's pretty perfect now. That's a joke, okay? Because in reality, knowing the imminency of the rapture, we know it could be true any time. But letting you know that this is the one who took it, and he took it on completely. This is part of the blasphemous names, that he has no trouble at all as the Antichrist, accepting all the religions and being the leader of all of them, with the exception of Christianity and Judaism under its proper authority, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? So, that's what that is. He accepts his throne. He accepts his power, which is how he does so much. And he grants his authority. He is the ruler of the entire world. Okay? So let's go to verse 3. I don't think there's anything else in here. Okay. Um, this is a little more complicated here, but it's fun to play with. Okay? Um, verse 3 says... Now, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. Okay? Um, now, I'll read another translation of this, so it has, I think, a little more feet to it. It says, I saw the one, uh, one of the heads uh, of it had been wounded to the point of death. Nevertheless, his mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Okay. The uh, the fatal wound is now. There's a there's a there's at least two other. I'm sure there's a bazillion interpretations of that. One of the interpretations, and I'll tell you why I think it's wrong. Um, and actually, some really great scholars believe these things. So I, I'm not taking anything away from them. Uh, I want to, many of them believe that it is the actual Antichrist who will be injured in a way that will make him die, and that Satan will bring him back to life. Okay, and that's one that you hear most commonly. The 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 problem with that is that Satan does not have the ability to bring life. He can only bring death. Okay? He does not have that power. Only God has that power. So I just want to tell you that. And notice what it says here. It says, it seems, notice the word seemed again? Okay? Host. Like. Okay? That means that we are now in a metaphor or a simile. We're into something that's telling us something is like this. Okay? Um, like he has a fatal wound, okay? Um, but what I want to bring you to is this piece here. Now, unless this Antichrist has more than one personal heads, it would make this a strange interpretation. Now, I'll tell you, uh, let me tell you the second interpretation. The second interpretation, what I think is a good one, and very similar, is that one of the heads is the head of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire ended... And then it's restored at the time of the rapture on the other side of it. Okay? And that's a pretty good one. I think that that's meaning the, the only problem is it doesn't refer to the head. The head we've already established is the religion. Okay? And I think that that's what it's talking about. Okay? What happens here, from what I can see, is that one of the heads is the head of one of these religions. Which one? The one that was ruling at the time of the Roman Empire. Okay? And why did it die? Okay? Why did it die? Enters Christianity. Okay? Christianity turned the Roman Empire over on its head. Okay? It became, it, 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 it overtook. In reality, it flourished. Christianity flourished like a raging, like a raging fire. I think we need some persecution in this country, so maybe Christianity can do that again. Oh, I think we may have some of that coming up. Just a little joke, sorry. You know, my work sense of humor. But I want to take you to this piece here where we see some of this, okay? We're going to go to Revelation 17, verses 9 through 10. Um, and we'll get to that. So I, I, I don't, I just want to orient you because I think it's pertinent to this verse. Um... <clears throat> There's a piece before it where it talks about the, the astonishment of the beast and, and all that stuff. But I want to start in verse 9 because this is the part where it says here, it says, This 
calls for a mind with wisdom. Okay? What does that mean? That means Bible doctrine will show you the way. That's what that means whenever you see that wisdom. He says the seven heads are the seven hills. And the seven hills here, is, it's actually not hills, they're actually mountains. Okay, the word is the word mountain, not hills. I think that somebody wanted, because it was in Rome, somebody wanted to put the seven hills in Rome, which there are seven hills in Rome, uh, which are talked about all the time. But these hills are not hills, they are mountains. Okay, and what is a mountain for? A mountain is an empire. Okay, it means a religious empire. And each of those seven places that we talked about, those seven were religious empires at the time, very unique and specific to the empire, as this one is. Okay. And he says, on which the woman sits. See, he's talking about these same religions. That same woman sits there that we talked about before. And the woman is false religion. Okay? On the seven hills, the seven religious empires of which the woman sits. Verse 10. <clears throat> it says, there are also seven kings. Now, the word king here is, not, is also the same, same word for kingdoms. Okay? So, use the word kingdom here which is the identical word, okay? And then look what it says here. He says, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. What does that mean? Five religions, at the time that John is writing this, five religions have fallen. What are they? Egypt, Syrian, Chaldean, um, uh, Medo-Persian, and Greco-Macedonian. Those are the first five. They've fallen. And he says, one is Roman Empire, the religion of the Roman Empire, which has emperor worship as well as many, many others. Okay? That is their collective. And it says, the other one has not yet come. That's the religion of the, of the revived Roman Empire. Okay? And then it says, but he does come and he must remain for a little while, okay? And we know that that little while is 42 months, right? We know that part. We'll come back to this, um, but in reality, that is a reference point. That helps us look at this thing. It explains the head, it explains where he is at, and it explains the apparent host's fatal wound. It also explains, but, the fatal wound, the head, right? One of his heads, Note, one of his heads has been healed, meaning it was revived and now becomes the one that rules the world at the time of the Antichrist. Okay? Um, the next piece of this piece here is the part where it says, the whole world was amazed. Okay? It was amazed because of this. For why? It tells us in the scriptures, because of the great power. Okay? He follows them in amazement. Now, I bought a little note here. It says, because those without Bible doctrine cannot discern a true Messiah or the Lamb from the dragon. As far as they're concerned, if you can think about it, this is what the world has wanted. The world has wanted a superhuman person. Okay? Uh, they don't want Jesus Christ but they want a superhuman person. They want a person who has all the intellect and all the, the, the religion. They want all that. And to be powerful and to have all these other qualities. In reality, that's what they are looking for. Okay? Um, but they are amazed and they follow after him in amazement. And in reality, is a, um, we'll find out later <coughs> how they do this. But the whole world, okay? This means the entire world system. Okay? This, this excludes it from true believers. Okay? But this is why it says, in order to discern these, you have to have Bible doctrine. Okay? So we have just a little bit of time left. Um, also, I wonder is that the, the word for amazed here, the admiration they have for him, is in the passive voice, which means they receive it. Okay? Passive means that the subject, which in this case, is the whole world, receives its amazement, okay? And how do you receive it? You receive it from Satan. You receive it because you are blinded, and the reality is that you do not see clearly. Um, so 
So let's go to verse 4. We have just a couple minutes. We'll just kind of touch with it and we'll, we'll come back to it on Tuesday. Verse 4, the people worship the dragon because he has given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and ask, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? So let's read another translation of it. It says, furthermore, they worship the dragon because he, he, he gave him power. Who is he? He is the dragon who is Satan, gave him, the Antichrist, the beast, power and authority. That's why they worship him. Okay? That's why they worship the Antichrist. Now, I want to just, okay, we'll finish this up, but I want to take it back up to the same verse here so we can see something. He says, um, to the beast, also they worship the beast. Notice that they worship both, okay? He says, they worship the dragon uh, because he gave him, okay, the beast, the, the power and authority to the beast. Also, they worship the beast, and they said, who is like him? Who can fight against him? Who can make war against him? Now, the important part is that it says here they worship the beast. What happens here is that, in reality, the, I mean, worships a dragon. The dragon is invisible. Okay, hopefully you got that. The dragon is invisible, and it is the beast who is visible. If, when we get through this, we'll see that they worship the beast and the, and the, and the idol. Okay? This is very similar to, uh, this has a very similar piece of it, is that it is God the Father behind the visible Christ who is worshipped. Okay? So Satan parallels this. Okay? Because Satan doesn't have the ability to be creative on his own. He can't come up with anything. He can only copy things. Okay, but also I want to bring you back to Corinthians and other places where this is very similar in some of the verses in Corinthians where it talks about that we all know that meat, that meat sacrificed to idols means nothing, but there are demons behind the idols. Idol is what you see, the demon is what you don't see, and behind that demon is Satan, who is also invisible. This is true with the world religions. Okay, there is what you see. And then without Christ, which means without God, if you've seen the Father, you've seen the Son, they're together. But if you cannot, then in reality you are worshipping behind that, you are worshipping Satan. So that's the picture here. By worshipping the beast that they see, they are worshipping the dragon they don't see, which is Satan. This is true with all false religions. It's true with idolatry. So we'll end it here. We'll come back and blow through this and uh, finish up the, um, this verse. Let's, um, let's uh, close in prayer. Dearest, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your um, wisdom on these things. Help us, help us not to do anything other than search your scriptures. Read these scriptures that have been given to make these comparisons, to look at this uh, truth that your Holy Spirit has provided and that your word has supported, that we may understand other religions that are not our own, the sincerity, all those pieces that you see, but all without Christ. We pray, Lord, that we are wise like those with wisdom, as the scriptures say, so we can discern one from the other. I pray, Lord, your blessing upon us as we live our everyday life, that we can see the dragon by the way he talks, by the, what, by the principles that he has, that are nothing like yours. Help us to understand your words and to make them ours so we can protect ourselves from this blindness, from this insanity that's called the world system. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.